Okay, welcome to our uh, open forum on U.S.-Iran uh, relations. Uh, my name is Nader Hashimi. I'm an assistant professor of Middle East and Islamic politics at the Joseph Corbell School, uh, and I'm also the new director of our uh, newly established uh, Center for Middle East Studies, which is co-sponsoring tonight's event. And um, our center hopes to do um, events such as this in greater frequency and with greater um, uh, quality in terms of the debate and the uh, discussion of um, U.S. Middle East relations in the coming uh, months and years. Uh, we have a website that will be set up fairly soon. You can find out more about our activities. You can put your name on our mailing list, and um, we hope that you will participate in um, our forthcoming events. Um, the genesis of tonight's um, discussion and debate on U.S.-Iran relations um, goes back to this past summer when I was approached by um, people affiliated with the uh, presidential debate that's taking place here next week. Um, there's a series of events leading up to the presidential debate and I was asked to organize event, an event on the Middle East. And of course it wasn't very difficult to choose a topic that was um, related to the U.S. presidential debate and that was connected to the Middle East. The question of Iran, Iran's nuclear program, U.S.-Iran relations, the possibility of uh, a war with Iran in the coming months is really at the top not only of the U.S. Um, um, U.S. political agenda, but really the top of, it's at the top of the you know, international agenda. And so we've put together this panel to explore the topic, um, to analyze it, and also to provide a forum for um, members of the University of Denver community to share their thoughts uh, on the subject. Um, uh, the format for tonight's event is that we have a keynote speaker who will speak for approximately 30 minutes, followed by 10 minutes of commentary and analysis from our panel. Um, after the formal presentations are over, we will go immediately to a, a question and answer session, and I'll get to the details and the rules of the Q&A session when we arrive there. Um, our keynote speaker tonight, um, um, very honored to have him, is Trita Parsi, the founder and president of the National Iranian American Council. He's an expert on U.S.-Iran relations, Iranian foreign policy, and the geopolitics of the Middle East. He has a doctorate from the Johns Hopkins um, University School of Advanced International Studies, where he studied with Francis Fukuyama and Zbigniew Brzezinski. And Trita is the author um, of a very important uh, first book. It's actually a major landmark study on U.S.-Iran-Israel relations called The Treacherous, Treacherous Alliance, The Secret Dealings of Israel, Iran, and the United States, published by Yale University Press in 2008. The book has won dozens of prestigious awards. It's been recognized by many um, 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 prestigious publications, uh, um, intellectual scholars who work in this area. Um, this year, Trita published his second book, uh, which really brings him here tonight, a book which is on sale outside called A Single Roll of the Dice, Obama's Diplomacy with Iran, also published by Yale University Press. The book has been praised by The Economist, The Guardian, The New Yorker, Foreign Affairs, and yes, even by Jon Stewart on The Daily Show. And I'm going to quote from Jon Stewart, since this is a university audience and students watch John Stewart sometimes more often than they read the New York Times. Um, so um, Stewart has actually said about Trita's book, quote, you got to get this book. Really, it's an amazing perspective on all the elements that go into even the smallest of diplomatic details. Um, and of course, followed, following Trita's initial presentation, we have a panel which really uh, does not need an introduction to a University of Denver audience. Um, very familiar faces. Chris Hill is our um, current dean at the Joseph Corbell School of International Studies, former American ambassador uh, to Poland, Macedonia, um, South Korea, and Iraq, um, not to mention my current boss. Um, um, Tom Ferrer is our former dean at the School of International Studies. He's an international lawyer, a human rights specialist, a distinguished scholar of international relations, and he's currently a university professor at the Joseph Corbell School of International Studies. And um, finally, Richard Lamb is, as many of you know, the former governor of Colorado. He's currently the co-director of the Institute for Public Policy Studies here at the university. And I was telling Richard just before we began, um, the most questions that I have received about tonight's debate in this panel have been about Richard Lamb. What position will he take on this debate? Where does he stand? And I guess we will 
soon find out. So without any further delay, let me turn the floor over to Trita Parsi. Um, the question that we are analyzing tonight is can a war with Iran be averted? The floor is yours for the next 30 minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nader, for that very kind introduction, particularly the mention of John Stewart. There's not been a single audience I've been to in which his endorsement wasn't the most important one that I've gotten. Thank you for, to the university here for inviting me. This is indeed a very important topic. Anyone who owns a TV set knows very well that this is frontline news constantly. And contrary to the expectations that I think a lot of people had with the election of President Obama, that this issue some way somehow would be resolved, we are currently in a position in which just a few months ago, Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta said that he puts the risk of a military confrontation at 50-50. So how do we get here and how do we get out of here? How do we make sure that we avoid what the US military believes would be a disastrous engagement, something that I think they are very uh, genuinely and intently trying to avoid. What I will do here today, I'm gonna give a talk based on what the Obama administration did, how the, how the diplomacy ended up falling short to what the expectations were, what were the mistakes, what were the successes, what were the perspectives of more or less everyone involved. And it's based on several interviews, about 70 or so interviews that I've conducted with decision makers on all sides of this issue. Everything from everyone of importance in the White House to the Iranian negotiators and decision makers to other P5 states, but also other states that were involved in this, including Turkey and Brazil, and I'll explain why. But before uh, going forward, let me start off actually by giving you a quote from President Obama himself. He said, to the Muslim world, we seek a new way forward, based on mutual interest and mutual respect. To those who cling to power through corruption and deceit, know that you are, um, uh, and the silence of dissent, sorry, know that you are on the wrong side of history, but that we will extend a hand if you are willing to unclench your fist. Only 12 and a half minutes into Obama's presidency, he reached out to Iran, offering America's hand of friendship in return for the Iranians unclenching their fist. This was a very bold move, but it was a move born out of necessity more than necessarily desire. To the best of our knowledge, Obama never had any childhood dreams of uh, negotiating with the mullahs in Iran. Rather, it was the situation in the region that had created the circumstances that had convinced him that it was necessary to find some sort of a, a relationship, functioning relationship with Tehran in order to address the conflicts in Iraq, in Afghanistan, and throughout the region. The backdrop to this, of course, is that the Bush administration had pursued a foreign policy that had very strong ideological uh, undercurrents. And one of the tenets of this ideology was that you do not talk to your enemies. Because if you do, you risk strengthening them and legitimizing them. As a result, the United States should only engage with those powers who deserve America's company. Now, we can have a separate debate about the validity of this ideological um, um, element of the foreign policy of the Bush administration. But I think the track record on Iran was quite clear. In 2000, Iran had more, more than a couple of dozen centrifuges. By the time the Bush administration left office, Iran had more than 8,000. Iran was squeezed between two hostile powers to its east and to its west, Iraq under Saddam Hussein, and the Taliban's government in Afghanistan. By 2008, Iran had become the, um, the kingmaker of the political order in those two states. Its influence had grown throughout the region, particularly in the Levant, and much of it was because of their taking advantage of America's growing unpopularity at that time. Against this backdrop, the administration comes in and decides and, and the president does something quite uh, extraordinary. He actually makes the idea of talking to America's enemies a center point of his foreign policy platform. And Iran became a poster child of that idea. I don't know if it was intentional or not, but nevertheless. What under normal circumstances would have cost a, uh, would have been political suicide to be frank, 
became a winning card in 2008 precisely because of the American public's general rejection of the Bush foreign policy and the ideology that it was built on. But the administration knew that time was short. Diplomacy with Iran was not going to be easy. And for several different factors, they came to the conclusion that it probably wouldn't be more than 12 months window that they had to be able to get some sort of a breakthrough. The factors that came into this was, of course, because the Iranians were continuing to amass low and rich uranium, and if they got to about 1,200 kilos of that, that would be enough material to build one nuclear bomb. That was a critical uh, metric that the administration was using to see how much time they had for diplomacy. There was also pressure from some of the US's own allies, countries like Israel and Saudi Arabia, who were quite hesitant about the idea of diplomacy, fearing that in a deal, their own security interests could potentially actually da be damaged. And as a result, seem to be fearing that the United States would actually cut a deal with the Iranians that would leave them out. There was also resistance from some European states. France, for instance, was very fearful that Obama would be so eager to make a nuclear deal that he would actually change the red lines that the Europeans and the US had come to agree on during the Bush administration. In fact, of all of America's close friends, many wished Obama well. Very few wished him success. And that was the starting point for his diplomacy with Iran. The first thing the administration did is recognize that the atmospherics between the countries needed to change in order to create a circumstance that would be conducive to the success of diplomacy. After 30 years of mutual demonization, in which the Iranians on every Friday prayer was chanting against the great Satan, and the United States had either put Iran in the axis of evil or called it a rogue state. The circumstances, the language was one of confrontation coming from both sides. And the administration very quickly moved to change the vocabulary and make it more uh, in line with the way you need it to be to resolve conflicts. To give you a quick example, candidate Obama on numerous occasions had said that he would pursue diplomacy with Iran using carrots and sticks. This is a common American expression doesn't have a negative connotation to it. But uh, early on in the administration, uh, the administration realized that this specific term translates very badly into Persian. It essentially means that Iran is a donkey, and the United States is either going to lure it or trick it into submission. Within two weeks, this term was eliminated from the State Department's vocabulary. Until this day, I've not seen any senior official use it in the context of diplomacy with Iran. The biggest step, however, was in the no rules message, the March 21st message of the president uh, videotaped, in which uh, he reached out to both the Iranian people and to the Iranian government. He explained that there are many problems between the two states, but he would like to see them resolved. He would like to see Iran come back into the um, circle of uh, states in the international community. And he said that these problems cannot be resolved through threats alone, clearly departing from the uh, policy and approach of the previous administration. This was completely unprecedented, and it went down very well uh, amongst the population in Iran. The response of the Iranian leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, however, was a bit disappointing, to put it lightly. Within 24 hours, he gives a speech in his hometown of Mashhad, in which he spends the first 30 or 40 minutes just going over a laundry list of every sin the United States has committed against Iran from his perspective. But towards the end, he gave a very, very small opening. He said that, if you change, we change. Indicating that Iran was not just looking for a change of tone. If there was a change in substance and policy, the Iranians would reciprocate. But then he also expressed a lot of doubt about Obama's ability to do so, saying that Iran does not know who actually makes the decisions in the United States when it comes to Iran. Is it the Congress? Is it the President? Or are there other forces in the shadows? I live in DC, I ask myself that question quite often, if not on a daily basis. So I'm not surprised that the Iranians would be confused about it. But that doubt, that inability to believe that Obama had the strength to move forward was something that has plagued the Iranians till this day and uh, reduced their inclination to take a risk for peace. Nevertheless, the message they gave was positive enough so that the administration decided to move forward with the diplomacy but they waited until after the Iranian elections because they didn't want to do anything that potentially could tilt the elections in Ahmadinejad's favor. The expectation was, however, 
that the, by uh, June 13th, the day after the elections, there would be some clarity in Tehran. There would be a winner, and there would be a couple of losers in the elections. What they didn't expect was exactly what happened, which was massive fraud in the elections, followed by even more massive human rights abuses that was uh, taped on people's cell phones, put on YouTube and Facebook, and then made it to CNN. So the entire world, and particularly the American people, could see what was taking place in Tehran. I know there's a debate in some corners about whether there actually was any fraud or not. I'm not going to go into that, but let me just give you a couple of anecdotes based on my interviews with folks who were in the opposition, who were later jailed in Iran, on what happened that to me was quite convincing that this is clearly a case of uh, fraud. The morning of the election day, uh, Musavi, who was the Green Party, uh, the Green candidate, had two headquarters in Tehran. One of those headquarters was attacked by about a dozen security officers who came in there and wanted to shut it down on election day, saying that there's a TV studio being operated out of it that doesn't have a license. That, of course, was not true. There was only just a bunch of young kids, volunteers, who were producing YouTube videos as a form of get out the vote. What happened, though, was that these volunteers um, wrestled down the security officers and tied them up and locked them down in the basement of the building. They called the head of the Iranian judiciary to try to figure out what to do with this. He told them, this is a police matter. Call the police. They'll come. They'll take care of it. They did so. They called the police. The police came. They took these people outside. On that, right outside of the building, on the spot, the police uh, unties them, releases them, and they disappear into the crowds. A couple of hours later, they're back, this time with reinforcement. They sack the headquarters, and they begin arresting the first and second circle of uh, advisors to both Karubi and Musavi, two of the prominent um, um, challengers to Ahmadinejad. A move that turned out to be decisive because it made it much more difficult for the green leaders to be able to communicate with their followers. And as the conflict uh, got more and more prolonged, uh, this became a major weakness of the green movement, the connection between the leadership and the grassroots. That evening, the TV stations in Iran were call, called up by the information ministry in ordering them to announce that Ahmadinejad had won the elections with 63 or so percent. This was incidentally before the polls actually had closed. Now, I'm not saying that the Iranians are as incompetent as our friends in Florida, but counting 40 million handwritten votes in a couple of hours, in fact, before the polls close, is a degree of efficiency that I've never seen the Iranian government exhibit on any other area. And, and mindful of the fact that those arrest orders that were given uh, for the advisors around Khata, uh, Karubi and Musavi were issued four days before the elections. May not be a smoking gun, but pretty convincing to me. Now, for the administration, this created a major problem because they needed someone, some sort of a partner on the other side to be able to negotiate with. And now there was just political chaos in Tehran. And more importantly, um, this was a major blow to the moral, um, a moral blow to what the administration's policy was, because it was one thing to argue for diplomacy in the abstract. It was a different thing to actually engage in it at a time when that specific regime was engaged in such horrific human rights abuses. But something had happened just 10 days before the elections that had convinced the administration that they absolutely had to give diplomacy a shot. On June 2nd, the Iranians send a letter to the head of the IAEA, El Barde, and tell him that Iran has run out of fuel for their Tehran research reactor, and a reactor that was given to the Iranians 40 or so years ago by the US that the Iranians used to produce medical isotopes for about 900,000 cancer patients. Fuel pads, which are the energy that you need to put in these reactors to make them work, are built off of low and rich uranium. And this created an opportunity, because the administration had been thinking throughout the spring, what can we do to convince the Iranians to take out the LEU and let it be shipped out to another country? So they're not sitting on the material that they need to use to build a bomb. We would feel so much more safe if we knew that they were not sitting on that LEU. Now, there was an opportunity, because the Iranians themselves came with a request to buy fuel pads. And the idea came up, instead of selling them fuel pads, let's take their LEU, turn it into fuel pads, and give it back to them. 
That way we get what we want. We don't want them to sit on the material that they can have for a bomb. And they get what they want. They want the fuel pads. El Barde also realized this, and as a result, he only informed the United States and Russia of this request, which incidentally was a break of his protocol. He was supposed to tell all of the different uh, providers. The US and Russia immediately begin um, discussing ideas of how they can put together some sort of a proposal to the Iranians. And then the question was, when do they start diplomacy? By August, it was clear. It would not be clear at any time soon when the political situation in Iran would calm down. And the decision was made to pursue diplomacy even though there was a realization that the Iranians most likely would not be ready. But if the administration didn't try to do this, out of the 12 months that they thought they had for diplomacy, they may never get the chance again. So they indicate to the Iranians that they would like to sit down and talk. The Iranians accept. And on October 1st in Vienna for the first time, or in Geneva, for the first time the US, the P5 plus one, and Iran sit down and the proposal is presented to the Iranians in principle. The Iranians accept. You also accept to um, meet again within two weeks or three weeks to discuss it at a technical level. And they also agree to open up um, one of their nuclear sites for further inspections. There's a lot of optimism. But then by the time they make it to Vienna on October 19th to hash out the details of the fuel swap, that's where all the problems begin. It's also at that point that the U.S. for the first time explains to the Iranians the details of the deal. And the details of the deal were such. The Iranians would ship out 1,200 kilos out of the 1,500 kilos of LEU that they had, send it to Russia. Russia would re-enrich it to a higher level. Then they would send it to France. France would turn it into fuel pads. The whole process would take about 9 to 12 months. And after 12 months or so, the Iranians would get their fuel pads. The main objection that the Iranians had was that just as much as the U.S. does not trust Iran, Iran does not trust the U.S. And this deal, according to the Iranians, would put too much of the risk on their shoulders because there was no guarantee that the West would not renege on the deal by the time that they got the Iran in LEU. And they came with counterproposals such as dividing up the 1,200 kilos into three batches of 400 kilos each. Every time they gave 400 kilos, they would get some fuel pads. That did not work for the US for two fundamental reasons. A, these fuel pads for that specific reactor is not available anywhere else. It would take at least six months to produce them. Uh, and as a result, some sort of instantaneous swap simply was not possible. But more importantly, the critical thing for the US was to make sure that Iran was as far away from 1,200 kilos of LEU as possible. If you just take out 400, they would constantly be in the neighborhood of 1,200 kilos. And the political win that the administration was looking for, the win of expanding the time for diplomacy, would not be achieved. By the third day of the negotiations, it was clear. Neither side was really changing their position. Neither side was really giving any concessions. It was more of an exchange of ultimatums than a real negotiation. And they decided to go back and figure out um, El Barde had the proposal that they would take this proposal back to the headquarters, to their capitals, and make a final decision three days later. They should all send in a written uh, acceptance or rejection of the proposal. The US, France, and Russia immediately accept, which wasn't too difficult. It was their own proposal that they accepted. The Iranians never come with a yes, nor with a no. They ask for more time, nothing in writing. And by November, it was clear after having made this investment in diplomacy, Obama had nothing to show for. It was not just the Republicans that had criticized him for this. Even his own Secretary of State had called him naive during the primaries for having um, uh, argued so strongly for diplomacy. And a decision was made that was called activating the pressure track. Now we were going to go to the Security Council to punish the Iranians for having rejected the fuel swap. And the hope was that by getting a very strong UN Security Council resolution, the administration would nevertheless be able to say that even though diplomacy didn't yield anything, the sanctions that they got would not have been achieved had it not been for the diplomatic efforts that had preceded the sanctions. The hope, of course, was that by February, when the French were holding the presidency of the UN Security Council, uh, very strong sanctions would be passed. It didn't turn out that way, though. The Russians and the Chinese put up a lot of resistance. They were not happy with ending diplomacy. They thought that there was still some chance of getting the talks to work. Um, and they were constantly resisting, and time was going by. 
and the administration was growing more and more um, cornered because of pressure from Congress. Congress wanted to pass sanctions on Iran. Congress usually has no difficulties passing sanctions on Iran. But the administration was insisting, do not pass unilateral sanctions before we get the UN multilateral sanctions. It's critical for us to be able to retain the coalition we have that Congress does not act before the UN Security Council. And the administration was constantly asking Congress for more and more time. By April and May, things started to get quite desperate. But at that moment, something else happened that the administration had not expected. Two countries in the Security Council, Turkey and Brazil, who were non-permanent members, decide that they want to give diplomacy a, a go on their own. And they want to mediate and try to find a solution to revive the fuel swap. On May 16th, Lula of Brazil arrives in Tehran. A, day, a couple of hours later, Erdogan is there, and they begin 18-hour marathon negotiations with the Iranians, trying to convince them to accept the fuel swap. And lo and behold, after 18 hours, to the surprise of everyone, including themselves, I think, they had a success. The Iranians agree, and um, the Brazilians and the Turks are ecstatic. They have managed to resolve at least a portion of an issue that the Europeans for years had tried without much success. The second person that Celso Amorim, the Brazilian foreign minister, calls after he leaves Tehran is Secretary of State Clinton. He explains to her the details of the deal, and the details were such that Iran would give up 1,200 kilos of LEU, put the LEU in Turkey. The Russians would use their own LEU to produce the fuel swap, uh, the, the fuel pass together with the French, and if during that 12 months that Iran would have to wait before they get the fuel, if the West were to renege the deal, the Iranians would get their LEU back from Turkey. That way, a mechanism was created in which neither side would have any incentive to violate the deal. He explains the terms of the deal to Clinton quite proudly, and to his shock, she makes it very clear, the deal is absolutely unacceptable. What the Turks and the Brazilians did not know was that two days before they arrived in Tehran, Russia and China had finally agreed on a sanctions draft in the Security Council. And the administration was now forced to choose between a nuclear breakthrough, the same breakthrough they themselves had sought, or sanctions at the Security Council. And the administration chose the sanctions. A lot of tensions emerged between Turkey and Brazil and the United States over this. Officially, the US position was that the deal had expired. And on technical grounds, the administration, in many ways, was actually correct. In May 2010, the Iranians had 2,400 kilos of LEU. You take out 1,200, they still have 1,200. Moreover, the Iranians had started to enrich uranium at the 20% level, which they had not in October 2009. And this was a provocation that was not addressed in the interim deal that the Brazilians and the Turks had done. And on those grounds, the administration defended the decision to reject the deal, saying that it had expired. It got so tense between the US, Turkey, and Brazil that a couple of days later, the Brazilians, someone in Lula's bureaucracy, leaks a letter to the Brazilian press. It was a letter from the President of the United States, dated April 20th, three weeks before Lula goes to Tehran, signed by the President of the US, in which President Obama is asking Lula, if you go to Tehran, please make sure that the Iranians agree to ship out 1,200 kilos of LEU. Have them put it in Turkey in an escrow, and have them accept that they're not going to get their fuel pass back until 12 months later exactly the deal that the Brazilians and the Turks actually managed to secure. In fact, at one point in the negotiations, the Turks show the letter that they had, because Erdogan got a copy of it as well, they show the letter to the Iranians to convince the Iranians, if you agree to this, we have already secured America's agreement. So why then did the administration reject the deal that they actually three weeks earlier had endorsed? To summarize, to simplify it, the administration had to choose to break one promise. They had promised Congress that Congress would get to pass its sanctions as long as they waited until after the UN sanctions were passed. But they also had made at least an implicit promise to the Brazilians. Six months before crucial midterm elections, the president was not going to break his promise to Congress. And there was also a fear that even if he did, 
even if he went and he accepted the deal, Congress would go forward with their own sanctions anyways. And those sanctions would have targeted Russia and China, and that would have created a conflict within the P5 plus one, which the Iranians then would be able to take advantage of. The administration had done quite a remarkable job in actually building a very strong international consensus against Iran so that the Iranians could not play the different powers in the Security Council against each other. If they had accepted the breakthrough in the negotiations, the fear was that uh, what would follow afterwards would be an inability to pursue those negotiations further because of the congressional sanctions. This is, of course, is based on the assumption perhaps incorrect by the administration, that they simply could not, did not have the political capital to go to Congress and tell them, we just actually had a great breakthrough, so please pause on your sanctions. But after having spent so much capital on the healthcare debate, there was a sense that they simply didn't have the ability to do so. Now, what does all of this show? Well, I think it gives a very good understanding that at the end of the day, Negotiations between the two sides actually have primarily faltered, at least during the Obama administration, as a result of uh, domestic politics. Even though the Iranians may have had some legitimacy in complaining about the unevenness that they perceived in the previous deal, it wasn't that that caused them to say no. What caused them to not come to a yes in October 2009 was domestic political infighting in Tehran in which neither side wanted to give the other, in particular neither side wanted to give Ahmadinejad the credit of having been able to conclude a deal with the United States. So they all moved against it. Seven months later in the United States we had a similar situation and it was against because of domestic politics and the fear of undermining congressional midterm elections that were crucial for the president that we chose to go with sanctions, which is always much more popular in Congress than to go with diplomacy. The title of my book is called A Single Roll of the Dice. It's actually a quote from one of Obama's own senior officials who told me that by the time the president had managed to get everyone to the table in October 2009, he had obviously hoped to do so much, much sooner. By that time, the policy had become a gamble on a single roll of the dice. It either had to work right away or not at all. And I know we have several very good diplomats here. They know there's no such thing as instantaneous diplomacy. Diplomacy takes time, it takes a tremendous amount of effort, and it takes a tremendous amount of commitment. In fact, if you compare it to some of the very successful negotiations the United States has had, none of them have been instantaneous or even quick. It took four years to normalize relations between the United States and Vietnam, between 1990 and 1994, over the course of two presidents. Another six years to get a full trade agreement. The negotiations with Libya that caused them to capitulate the nuclear program took exactly seven years. Long periods of time that it was actually on ice because the talks broke down. But they were revived and eventually they succeeded. There's a wonderful quote from Senator Mitchell who mediated the Good Friday Agreement in Northern Ireland. He said on Charlie Rose that for the first 700 days, both sides told him that they would never agree to anything the other side would agree to. On the 701st day, they both changed their minds. Fortunately for us, and obviously fortunately for the people of Northern Ireland, Senator Mitchell never gave up. He had the political capital and the, st the stamina to be able to sustain the talks, and eventually they succeeded. What we have seen between the United States and Iran, at times I think has been very genuine. I believe that ad this administration is very genuine about getting to a nuclear um, uh, diplomatic solution. But it takes a tremendous amount of political capital and tremendous amount of political will and strength. In fact, the biggest risk in my view for a war, and as to why we may end up in a situation that I don't think anyone really wants, is that if the political landscape on both sides are such that it is politically less risky for a decision maker to send off thousands of servicemen and women off to a war even an unavoidable war, than it is for that same decision maker to send off a couple of dozen diplomats off to negotiate. Well, then we're going to continue to have a situation in which there's going to be far more clenched fists than open hands between the United States and Iran. Thank you so much. Trita, thank you very much for those remarks. Um, can I call on Tom Ferrer to... Um, Lead the, uh, the, you want to stay at the table, Tom? Uh, either way. You can, uh, whatever you're comfortable with. You know that mic works. It does. 
I just want to sacrifice a few seconds of my 600 seconds to congratulate Peter Parsi on really an eloquent and incredibly insightful talk. And thanks for, thanks for being with us. I didn't know what he was going to say. And so I thought I ought to set out a few remarks to help to structure the discussion. And it turns out I think they're complementary because they're addressed to the question of if diplomacy fails, should we go to war? Now, having observed foreign policy decision-making over four decades, it's evident to me that wherever important interests are at stake, the choice among options is at best an intuitive leap rather than the outcome of some rigorous cost-benefit analysis. Sometimes decisions stem from some primitive conviction, such as all these people understand is force. Sometimes they are profoundly influenced by a decision makers' concern with domestic politics, the point you brought up, as in the case of the Cuban Missile Crisis or Lyndon Johnson's escalation of the Vietnam War. Another common source of choice among options results from political leaders rummaging around mentally in the attic of history in a feverish search for some precedent to guide decision, which is much like a blind squirrel searching anxiously for a nut. It's a dubious exercise because history is not a set of cases. It is a raging stream of countless facts out of which we snatch a few in order to create cases which we unconsciously shape to fit our needs. And then what? How do we rationally decide whether the appropriate analogy is, for example, Munich or conversely Vietnam, whether to compromise or to escalate? Now, I don't want to overstate the problematic character of foreign policy decisions. A person with a mind relatively free of the cruder forms of chauvinism, a person sensitive to fact, made modest by an appreciation of history's opacity, and possessing a sensibility which enables one to imagine how your adversaries may see the issues that divide you, is more likely to exercise better judgment. But the fact remains, as former Secretary of Defense Don Rumsfeld, to be sure not my favorite American, once remarked, when things did not go as planned in Iraq, when you go to war, there are the known unknowns, and then there are the unknown unknowns. The only thing I can contribute is a sketch of the mental process I've gone through in trying to decide whether if push comes to shove, the US should attack Iran and prevent it, or try to prevent it, however temporarily, from arriving at the threshold of the capacity to produce a bomb. When it comes to the use of force, I find myself in agreement with an observation by Winston Churchill, hardly a pacifist, who wrote in an autobiographical work, the statesman who yields to war fever is no longer the master of policy, but the slave of unforeseeable and uncontrollable events. In short, I begin with a presumption against the use of force, so the burden of persuasion lies with the advocates of force precisely because its results have so frequently been unforeseeable and so frequently have been more costly, much more costly, than anticipated. In this, as in other cases where force is an option, I move on from that presumption to international law and ask myself whether the proposed use is arguably consistent with existing normative restraints. I turn to international law, not in the manner of a pagan priest genuflecting to an idol, but rather for prudential reasons. The international legal order being based on consent, each of its rules represents a consensus of states about what restraints serve their respective national interests, a calculation of national interests made after careful internal deliberation. It follows that a dramatic violation of a clear and widely accepted rule makes the violator appear to be a dangerous state, and to be so perceived is not in the national interest. In addition, however, and paradoxically, a dramatic violation of accepted rules by a leading state loosens the collective perception of living within an authentic legal order, and so it contributes to the deterioration of the restraints on violence. Imagine a debate 10 years from now within the Chinese leadership about whether to use force to seize the Senkakus Island chain or Taiwan. If we attack Iran without horrendous consequences, our action would undoubtedly be cited by the Chinese advocates of force. My premise is that a more orderly world would serve U.S. interests in essence because we are a commercial republic. 
as opposed to a predatory imperial state like Germany was at the end of the 19th century. The legal case for attacking Iraq was weak. The legal case to justify attacking Iran is weaker still. To be sure, there are rare occasions when assaulting another country without the justification of self-defense may be seen as morally legitimate, even though illegal, if force were the only way to prevent another government, for example, from slaughtering a part of its population. Its use would probably satisfy the criteria for just war and be seen as legitimate, even though not legal. I not, don't think Iran constitutes such a case. The existence, much less the proliferation of nuclear weapons, is unquestionably the greatest single th threat humanity faces, a fact so brutally clear that even Henry Kissinger has belatedly become an advocate of nothing less than comprehensive nuclear disarmament. If preventing proliferation as a step toward general and comprehensive denuclearization had been consistently the top priority of U.S. foreign policy, then bombing Iran to the end of sustaining that policy would at least be principled in a certain sense. But it has not been a decisive priority and isn't today. One recent example of our real priorities, I'm not saying they're wrong priorities, just what our real priorities are, was the decision to grant India access to advanced nuclear technology, despite its acquisition of nuclear weapons. We and all other peoples have every reason to dread the further spread of nuclear weapons, and particularly their development or acquisition by non-governmental actors. But if we were making up a list of countries most likely to transfer weapons or nuclear materials to such groups, or most likely to fail to prevent such transfer, I should think that Pakistan would be higher on the list than Iran. The case for bombing Ar Iran has essentially four arguments. One is that Iran, under its present regime, is an aggressive state. If its, if its pursuit of at least the capacity to stand at the threshold of nuclear weaponization appears to be defensive in character, then that argument fails. And whether we look at the recent or the more distant past, Iran has the character more of a victim than a predator. Iran's is a history of weakness. Its political independence and territorial integrity constantly threatened by more powerful states. The British dominated the country during World War II. The Russians threatened it after the war. US and British intelligence used clandestine means to destroy its experiment with democracy in the 1950s. Iraq invaded it in 1982 and prosecuted a war of aggression with US and Gulf Arab support. We've actively sought regime change for the past 20 years. The country does not have the size or the internal cohesion to be a great power. It's, it will remain vulnerable to more powerful states. For a regime like the current one in a country with Iran's history, a weapon of mass destruction or the ability to move quickly to weaponize makes unfortunate sense as a guarantor of survival. The second argument is the leadership is apocalyptic, ready to assume the role of a kind of collective suicide bomber because they believe in divine redemption and eternal life. If there is powerful evidence to that effect, the argument for bombing would be powerful. But among experts, I don't find a conviction that the leadership is either suicidal or nuts, assuming the two are different. The, th the third argument is that a nuclear arm would trigger more extensive proliferation in the Middle East, and that I think is a real risk. But I think it's one we can manage by making our de facto guarantee of protection for the Saudis and the Emiratis conditional on their not going nuclear. After all, the threat to them is not a nuclear is not nuclear attack by Iran, but conventional war or subversion. And to counter those threats, we have impressive means. The fourth is that a nuclear Iran would become the regional hegemon. And I don't think that argument passes the laugh test. The US is the regional hegemon and can remain so as long as it wishes. Just war requires confidence on the part of those initiating it that, the more, that more good than harm will result. And we can't feel that confidence. An attack, if it comes, will begin with the suppression of air defense systems, which would presumably include communication systems and possibly electrical systems. Then it will be extended to the various nuclear facilities, to laboratories and enrichment sites. In other words, it will be extensive. And even without escalation, will kill or cripple many hundreds, 
possibly thousands of people, including scientists, engineers, administrators, clerks, and other civilians, all of whom will have parents, children, extended families, and friends who will curse our name. We will be killing people from the educated classes, the natural enemies of the present regime. Nothing is certain, but the likelihood is the attack will strengthen the regime by displacing the rage of its internal opponents and justifying more draconian internal security measures. And finally, we get to the most salient known unknowns. Will the regime escalate by attacking the Gulf oil and gas fields and refineries? If it does, if it fires missiles at Israel, we will be in an escalation scenario that could set the region aflame. There is another known unknown. Will this third assault on a Muslim nation within a dozen years strengthen the bin Laden narrative in which asymmetrical war against the West is a defensive response to aggression? Will it strengthen the capacity of terrorist groups to recruit and finance their activities at a time when the Maghreb, the Middle East, and West Asia are experiencing social and political upheaval? We don't know. So I would conclude by saying that bombing Iran will be an isolated, improvised, and ultimately probably futile step toward preventing further proliferation, a step which ironically is likely to strengthen the conviction of governing elites in weaker states that the only guarantee of security from stronger states is to stealthily acquire and where possible preposition weapons of mass destruction and then announce their existence when and if they are existentially threatened. For all these reasons I've sketched, I conclude that the presumption against the use of force has yet, has not yet been overcome. Thank you. Great. Tom, thank you very much for those um, very important remarks. I think you've laid out the important legal and sort of moral questions that face us with respect to this topic. I'm going to call on um, Chris Hill now. Um, when, when Trita was speaking, I was writing in my notes, what does Chris Hill have to say about this narrative of diplomacy, since you've been involved in many of these negotiations? So um, the floor is yours for the next 10 minutes, approximately. Well, thanks very much, Nader, and thanks for what you're doing at the Corbell School and for your new uh, Middle East Center. I think uh, a Middle East Center is going to be in business for quite a while here. Um, and um, Trita, congratulations on this terrific book. It, uh, I saw you on Jon Stewart. You weren't as funny as Jon Stewart, but you tried. I mean, it, it wasn't bad. Uh, um, let me uh, just... Uh, already used about 60 of my 600 words, but uh, let me um, talk a little about how this might look from an administration point of view in Washington. Whether you are the Romney administration, whether you are the Obama administration, whether you are the Dennis Kucinich administration, no administration in Washington is going to allow sit around while Iran develop, becomes a nuclear weapon state. No one can accept that. It is politically impossible to accept it. You have a Congress where you would, if, if you put that question to the Congress, 99% of the people would say, no, we can't accept that. Uh, if you look at a public opinion surveys, it's very strong. No one is prepared to accept a nuclear Iran. So the real question is, um, what are we going to do about it? And there's where I think this is one of those classic issues where there is not a single answer that is a good answer. And what you end up with, with is a least, uh, least bad answer. I think um, the Obama administration, but really starting in the second term of the Bush administration, understood the value of negotiation. Now, negotiation doesn't necessarily mean that you sit across the, a felt-top table uh, with your adversary and at a certain point they uh, hit the side of their head with the palm of their hand and say, God, now I get it. Okay, we'll give up these nuclear weapons. That'll be it. It doesn't happen that way. It is, as uh, uh, Trita made the point, a long-term uh, process, if you're lucky. 
But what you do in the process of negotiation is convince others, convince the rest of the world, convince your allies that you're serious about doing something about this by peaceful means. And I think the uh, Bush administration tried to do that in the second term, but it had the legacy of the first term to overcome, and I think it was not, uh, it was not successful in overcoming the presumption that it wasn't entirely serious about, uh, about negotiation. So I think any administration coming in in January, whether it's the Obama second term or Governor Romney's first term, will have to look at this, uh, this issue and I think get serious on the negotiating track. Now I agree with a lot of the analysis that Trita posed, which is there was a lot of politics in, uh, in diplomacy. You know, it used to be that uh, politics stopped at the water's edge. Well, that is a very quaint thought these days. I mean, it was rather extraordinary to me to hear our president in the United Nations yesterday and just one hour before his main opponent, Governor Romney, was blasting him on every foreign policy issue he could think of. This kind of stuff didn't happen in the past, it happens today. So there's, there's a lot of politics here. And so I think the, uh, the Obama administration tried to get into uh, uh, a negotiation and I think they were unable to do it for a lot of reasons. But before we just presume that all the problems are on our, our side of the water, we ought to have a little look at Iran. The first thing to understand about Iran, let me contrast Iran with North Korea. Now North Korea, cuddly people, only a mother can love. I mean, <laughs> at least the North Koreans get up and say, we got a nuclear weapon and we're gonna have more of them. You know, deal with it is basically their, their line. The Iranians have not even been honest about what their objectives are. And when you start with a kind of public lie about what you're doing, when you claim that you're enriching to 20% for the purpose of medical isotopes, when you have four, four uh, enrichment facilities, of which two, two of these enrichment facilities, including the one at Fordo, are some 300 feet below uh, the surface, in rock caverns, it's a little hard to believe that this is about medical isotopes. And yet this is, this is their claim. They have worked very hard on, on their enrichment technology. They did, as, as Trita said, develop a stockpile, uh, not an extensive stockpile, but a beginning of a stockpile of, uh, of low enriched uranium, which is about 3.5%. You know, natural uranium comes at 1%. You get low enriched at 3.5, you get medium at 20. And then because this is a kind of logarithmic function, you get to over 90% pretty quickly from the 20, and that's when it becomes weapons grade uh, plutonium, weapons grade uranium. And that can be done fairly quickly. And you can have IEA people standing around and monitoring it. But if you make the decision to go from 20% uh, percent to 90, it can be done. You could probably produce weapons grade plutonium, uh, weapons grade uranium. I'm sorry, the Nor North Koreans were engaged in a plutonium program. And so constantly making that mistake. When you go from uh, 20 to, to 90, you can do it in a matter of months. So I don't think the Iranians have made that final go there. Because when they do, that could well trigger a red line. And so the red line meaning that could trigger a decision to, uh, to go in and, and attack them. So I think the Iranians are kind of getting set for what they hope will be a program where they are ready if they make the final decision to go to weapons grade. Now, you also have to put it on a missile. Uh, you have to miniaturize a, uh, an explosive device uh, it, it has a lot of simultaneous, very, very high-tech explosives to get it to go off. It's on the tip of a missile. This is not easy stuff to do. But what we've seen from the Iranians is a program consistent with developing weaponized, with developing nuclear weapons. So the first thing you need to try to do is convince others and show the Iranians that you're serious about a negotiation. For some of the domestic political reasons we've already heard, I don't think we've done that. I don't think the negotiations have really even started. Uh, we have had basically three and out negotiations. They arrive on a Tuesday, they have a negotiation session on Wednesday, and, and the chairman of the process, whether it's the European Union uh, 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 
Mrs. Ashton, uh, you know, releases some statement and maybe, maybe not, they'll have an agreement on a subsequent negotiation. When I was getting involved uh, with the six-party process uh, with the North Koreans, they boycotted the process through the last two years of the first Bush administration. I told the Chinese that if we don't get something out of this session, uh, we're going to, uh, no one's going to believe that we have anything going. And I convinced Wu Dawei, the Chinese, uh, the chairman of the, of the six-party process, that we should arrive on a Tuesday, stay on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. We stayed three weeks until, uh, with the North Koreans kind of gasping for air, uh, we ended up taking a two-week break and then we came back again. So I think the first sign that the, uh, political, that the um, diplomatic process is, is, is real, is that they actually stay and try to work something. The second sign is, I'm not sure we've put a lot on the table. Now again, I don't cut much uh, sympathy for the Iranians. You know, people always say that diplomacy is a matter of looking at people and lying. It's not. I mean, this idea that you lie in diplomacy is really uh, quite wrong. And that's precisely what the Iranians are doing. It annoys people, it upsets people to have someone look you in the eye and lie to you about their programs. So they gotta get serious at this, uh, at this negotiation and they've gotta start acknowledging what they're doing and they've got to start agreeing that there might be a solution out there that they can live with and I think the eventual solution, if there is a uh, solution, is to have a situation where they do not control the fuel cycle, whether you send some, thing, some uh, material out for uh, enrichment up to a certain percent, wh whether you do that in tranches of the, way, of the kind that were uh, discussed. Uh, they, there's probably something along the lines of not controlling the fuel cycle. Now, by the way, we're talking about the world's fourth largest uh, uh, oil producer in the world. Actually, Iraq, Iraq passed them recently, I mean, which uh, shows you something. So the, um, you do kind of wonder why all this nuclear stuff if they're the fourth largest uh, um, uh, oil producer. So I would say get a serious negotiation going. The second thing I'd do is I'd keep squeezing them. I would uh, keep putting sanctions on and uh, just tell them it, it, when they complain about sanctions and say this is in bad faith, you say tough because you're producing nuclear weapons, they're gonna, we're gonna come after you, we're gonna continue to come after you. And the third thing I do beyond, beyond negotiation, beyond sanctions, is uh, to do precisely what the Obama administration has been doing, which is to come after them in every kind of clandestine program you can think of. Again, you have to convince them that they are going to live in a world of hurt until they get serious about this uh, negotiation. There is no question that if they gave up these nuclear weapons, Iran and Iran's people can have a much better future. They will not be invaded in the future. They can get all kinds of security uh, guarantees. This notion that they've been traumatized by history and that's why they need nuclear weapons. Every country in the world has been traumatized by history and not every country in the world try to sol tries to solve that with clandestine nuclear programs. So I think we need to really sharpen the choices for them, make their future very bad until they understand they gotta get serious. So if all of that fails, then it probably is time for a very bad idea. The first thing is we don't want Israel to do it. That would be rather catastrophic. If we're going to, uh, because Israel, with F-15s crossing uh, Iraqi airspace is not going to be able to solve the problem. They can set it back maybe a few months, maybe up to two years. The Israelis are not going to be able to solve the Iran nuclear problem. If anything, Iran will galvanize around a nuclear program and it will become impossible ever to negotiate it. And if we do it, we're going to have to be in a sustained world, in a sustained state of war, which is going to be very painful. We can hold it off for several years. We're going to have to keep coming back at them. And most of all, we're going to need partners in this endeavor. We cannot do it alone. Those days for us, I think, are over. So I think it's a very tough situation when I think of what the, uh, a new administration is going to look at in uh, January, whether it's Obama's second term or Romney's first. I think uh, Iran is the number one issue, and for that reason, I think it's very appropriate that we get together and have a little discussion about it tonight. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Chris Hill, thank you very much. Uh, last but certainly not least, uh, Richard Lamb. The floor is yours for the next 10 minutes.
It's an honor to share a panel with um, three illustrious speakers. Bottom line, I believe that conflict with Iran would be disastrous, absent facts that are not now on the table. Let me begin by praising President Obama, both on his strength and on his discretion. I believe that so far he's got an incredible and balanced Iranian policy. There are no good options, as Chris Hill has told us. But his predecessor, President George W. Bush, in an unbelievable act of geopolitical malpractice, gave Iran an incredible gift by neutralizing Iran's great enemy, Iraq and Saddam Hussein. The war in Iraq unbalanced the Middle East in favor of Iran uh, and had little strategic value to the United States. President Obama was left to deal with the results. The president got us out of that tragic and counterproductive war, but Iran was the beneficiary for all our lost lives and our great expense. Number two, President Obama is not letting himself get pushed into any red line or any promises to attack Iran's nuclear facilities. He is showing political courage in standing up to Israel's right-wing government. There is, this is no small thing in an election year. Confirming the president's stand, the leaders of Britain, France, Russia, China, and Germany all are, uh, are um, uh, pushing back against calls for red lines. We have given Israel massive military and economic aid over the years, and we have a strong alliance with them. In the current vernacular, we have their backs. But we should not give Israel a blank check. Prime Minister Netanyahu is kept in power by settlers and right wing of Israel, and the U.S. needs to chart its own independent course on Iran. This means discouraging any Israeli military strikes while sharing uh, our, uh, and strongly articulating our uh, continuing alliance with Israel. The stakes of an imp a possible military strike is not only in Iran, but uh, the Shia population in uh, Lebanon, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, and the Persian Gulf, uh, the Palestinians, a military strike would be uh, disastrous to the entire Middle East with unknown black swan consequences. So Iranian strategies appear to uh, uh, agree. There are a number of Iranian strategists in Iran that appear to agree, which was so well articulated by our other speakers, that nuclear weapons will bring Iran further sanctions, military constraint, more US interference, and more hostility to its neighbors. In his book, Confront and Conceal, um, David Sanger of the New York Times, who was just recently on this campus, describes the US war simulations that have been uh, uh, assumed that Israel attacks uh, Iran. I quote him. He says, soon the battle sucks the region in, and then it sucks Washington in. The war um, shifts to defending Saudi oil facilities against Iranian attack, and Iran's use of proxy means that other regional players quickly become involved, and in the end, no one wins. August 1914, anyone? So diplomacy does need more time to work. No one favors stalling ta tactics but meaningful nuclear diplomacy did not even begin until late 2009, as Tom Ferrer told us. It has to be given a chance to work. Con in conclusion, Iran's acceptance of an intrusive nationwide inspection that will make us more secure in exchange for Western acceptance of limited enrichment to low levels of under tight international supervision in Iran is not impossible, is still a great possibility. And demography is destiny, uh, at least in certain cases. Iran has a young population which gives every indication of being uh, both modest, modern and less troublesome. The best way for the United States to promote freedom and democracy in Iran is really, if it really wants to, is through self-restraint. We should speak up for democracy and human rights in Iran and elsewhere. 
Time and the digital revolution are on our side. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Richard Lamb, and thanks to all the um, uh, panelists. Uh, we've now arrived at the uh, question, answer, and discussion period. And since this event has been advertised as an open forum, I'm going to allow for um, comments and questions from the floor that last a bit longer than the standard format, which means about 60 seconds, you know, a question or a comment up to maybe, um, um, you know, 90 seconds at most. But please, no speeches. Please don't abuse the right of everyone here to um, ask a question and to hear from our panelists. And to our panelists, I'm going to ask them to keep their answers as brief as possible. We do have to, you know, vacate this room around 9 o'clock. That gives us about 40 minutes. And if everyone agrees to play by the rules, I think we can cover a lot of ground and have a really good exchange with the audience and then with the panel. So with those as the ground rules, I'll um, open the floor and I'll try to identify hands as I see them um, raised in the air. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, great. You know, I think we, we got the two questions, yeah. Um, and I'm assuming that they're for the entire panel, it's not for any individual um, panelist. Yeah, and so you can, anyone can take it. Um, um, I think the question, just to sort of summarize, is what role will Israel play if there's an attack on Iran? Um, to what extent is Israel sort of a, a key factor here in leading this to war? And then the question of a precedent, what, uh, what guarantees perhaps Iran can be given or should be given to feel secure that if it does negotiate on the nuclear question, it, it, it's, its basic territorial integrity and the security of its regime will be intact. So, Tom, uh, Chris, you want to take that? I can, I can start. I'm sure. sure everyone has a view on it. I think uh, for the Israelis to attack would be rather a disaster. I think they would, uh, first of all, they don't have the capacity to deal with the problem. I mean, what you have to look at first is, can you deal with the problem? And if the answer is yes, then you can look at what the costs of that are. But I don't think the Israelis have the capability of dealing with the problem. I think what they'll end up doing if they attack is they will start a war in the Middle East and draw us in. Because we will have no choice but to support Israel. I mean, they're our ally, and I don't think any, I don't, I don't see, I don't see any administration, not the Obama administration, Romney, or anyone else saying, hey, Israelis, you, you started this dance, we're not going to help you. I, it's just not, it, that's not how we're going to act. So I think they would draw us in. So I think it's a rather catastrophic uh, outcome, and I think we ought to uh, uh, really make clear the, to the Israelis they, they shouldn't do that. Uh, the, the problem, of course, is that uh, Netanyahu keeps saying things, and I think he's kind of, he's beginning to back himself into a corner politically in Israel, and uh, one is very worried about that. So uh, the real question is these next few months are whether Netanyahu will stop doing this, um, because I think it could, I think Netanyahu is kind of playing with our politics right now. And, fi and on the, your second point about the uh, question of uh, what we could put on the table, we could have a normal relationship with Iran. There's no question about it. We could really lift just about every sanction. I mean, there'd be a few people pointing out that Iran has, uh, has uh, this uh, miserable human right rights record. We should keep some outer ring of sanctions. There'll be a lot of pressure for that. But I think overall, we could put a pretty good package on the table for a non-nuclear Iran. Oh, and by the way, for a package that would include uh, allowing Iran to have a, a civil nuclear program. But I don't think we or anyone else is going to put anything on the table with a, uh, an Iran that's left standing as a nuclear state. I don't think we're prepared to put up with that. And it's mainly because of the proliferation issues with all the Sunni countries insisting that they should have bombs too. Okay. Tom, Richard, Trita, do you want to take any part of that? There's no obligation to do so. We can always go to another question. I, I agree largely with what Chris said. I think that the, the Israelis could force us to become involved. That is, by initiating the conflict, the overwhelming likelihood is that however, that even though they defied us by initiating the conflict, the likelihood is that they would draw us into the conflict. Presumably, the best outcome for them is simply to have us succeed in preventing, is, uh, preventing Iran from acquiring the bomb, whether through intensive a combination of diplomacy and sanctions, you could say it's all part of diplomacy, and I think that's an accurate way of describing diplomacy. But if, if that fails, to use force to prevent, to terminate the program. I think 
that rationally that is the Israeli, ought to be the Israeli goal. Uh, on the question of providing Iran with guarantees of medium to long-term security, that's a difficult question. The, the Iran under the present regime will still be seen as an unfriendly state. So even though we may in fact not wish them ill or at least be prepared to abstain from continuing to seek to turn the regime, will the Iranians believe that and will we in fact totally eschew the possibilities of undermining the regime? And nor are we the only threat to the Iranians. They, they live in a very rough neighborhood and they have been threatened historically by other more powerful, more powerful states. So I think there is an element of insecurity here. It's not a question of saying that the, I, I certainly didn't mean to imply the Iranians ought to have a right to secure nuclear weapons because they feel insecure. No, we don't want, we don't want any further proliferation. We certainly don't want proliferation to a, a country with whom we have extremely unfriendly relations. I guess the final thing I'd say in connection with security is we could invoke the case of Cuba. We could say, we gave guarantees at the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis that we would not, we would not attack Cuba. And we have a very, we've continued to have a very hostile relationship with Cuba, but we have not in fact attacked them. And that's a precedent for the fact that once we commit ourselves to a deal, even if it's with a regime we don't like, we can adhere to the deal. So that's, I think that's all I would say at this point. Richard Treated? Well, I would like to know from my fellow panelists, does anybody think long term we can really prevent Iran from getting a nuclear weapon? I mean, how many times are we going to have to bomb them? Uh, I think they would have to bomb them every few years. I think when you start down that road, you're, there's just incredibly unknown consequences. Yeah, I think that's actually a really good question. I'm just going to interject here because one of the issues in the debate is that, uh, that emerges that, is that we actually do have a military option here that can end the crisis by preventing Iran from developing a nuclear weapon or the capacity to build one. But then you get into this cycle where you may be able to take out the nuclear program, but you can't bomb the technology to build a weapon, nor the willpower of, a, of, of the regime to pursue it. So are we going to be bombing Iran every two years? Is this going to be a perpetual war? And so it raises the question, is a, is, is a military option a realistic possibility given, given the limitations and the consequences that would flow from, from just one initial strike, let alone multiple strikes in terms of regional stability, international peace and security? I mean, that's just a, that's, that, that's just a, I think, a question to ponder. If you could increase the choices to Iran, and I don't think they would be indifferent to being bombed every few years. So uh, uh, I, I, uh, I suspect that uh, you could uh, sharpen the choices such they might, they might make a different choice. Now, I'm the first to say, though, that once you uh, use military action, don't expect them to just roll over and say, we surrender. I mean, they would... Uh, clearly want to respond in their own way, and I think that's what makes uh, military action absolutely a last resort. Right. And that's where I part company on many people who think it's uh, some kind of solution. It's right. at best a, a five-year solution. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I think it's very important that we not uh, sort of give in to the notion that they're going to be welcomed as a nuclear state. Okay. Trita, any, any thoughts on any of this? Yeah, um, if I could start off by addressing the questions that was asked. Uh, I think it's a very important question, and I would start off by saying I, I really don't think the likelihood of the Israelis doing something is particularly high. We have seen a very long trend of the Israelis making these threats. In fact, already back in 1992, the Israelis were warning that Iran is two to three years away from a bomb. Time passes, but they're always two to three years away from a bomb. And there's been threats, particularly in the last 10 years of military action, and Every time up until now, it's essentially been a bluff, and it's been a very lucrative bluff because it's been absolutely critical for, from their perspective to convince the world to go along with a very, very strict sanctions regime, stricter than probably anything else that we've had. Um, had it not been for the constant threat of Israeli uh, attacks, the likelihood of this sanctions regime being adopted, including the Europeans going along with uh, oil sanctions in the middle of their financial crisis would probably not have happened at all. 
Right now, actually let me put it this way, four weeks ago, for Netanyahu to once again begin that rhetoric and saying that there's a zone of immunity, Israel is not going to wait forever, actually put him in a pretty good win-win situation because either the Obama administration would acquiesce and either take military action or go along with even more sanctions, and that would have pleased Netanyahu, I believe, or the Obama administration could have pushed back, which is what they did. But when they push back, the administration accentuates the difference between Obama and Romney on the issue of Iran and on the issue of Israel, which the Netanyahu government calculated, perhaps incorrectly, would have benefited Romney in the elections. If, however, so it's a pretty clear win-win, although I think he overplayed it and he turned it into a losing situation for himself. But if he actually were to actualize the threat, he would be faced with, with exactly the unpredictable consequences that was laid out here earlier. This may be some of the last periods in which he has the chance of making these type of threats, because if you have a Romney, if you have an Obama II administration, I suspect that the Obama administration is not going to be as sensitive to Israeli threats as it has been so far. If you have a Romney administration and the president, Romney, chooses to listen to America's generals, then I don't think he's going to go down the path deliberately towards war very quickly. And the question then is, is the Netanyahu government willing to pressure a Republican administration to the extent that he has pressured a Democratic administration so publicly and frankly so blatantly? And I suspect that he wouldn't. He's not, I think he's miscalculated American politics right Yeah, now. I agree. I agree. I think so he... I don't think he, it's a win-win for him. I think he, at that moment, thought that it was, and to a certain extent it could have been, but he overplayed it, and then something else happened, which is that Romney really kind of blew it for himself, and that has really strengthened the confidence of the administration, so they're willing to push back in a way they probably could have done months ago, but at that moment, they were not willing to risk it. Yeah. Okay, great. Let's go to another question. Uh, yeah, Doug. Thank you. I think that's a great question. And talking about unknown unknowns and known unknowns, well, Iranian politics is an unknown unknown, I would say. Um, it's going to be quite interesting to see what happens there. I think the Iranian regime itself is in a very, very difficult position. It's, uh, the opposition to it amongst the population is overwhelming, overwhelming. Um, and the regime itself has oftentimes used the elections as some sort of an injection of legitimacy into a system that otherwise is, is uh, clearly um, uh, lacking a lot of support. But they're not going to be able to get people to get out and vote, again, mindful of what happened last time. Unless they do something that really convinces the population that this time around the votes actually will count. And that would mean that Khamenei, after having so successfully closed down the political space, moved the Iranian political spectrum to the right and made it contract. He would now have to reverse that process, open it up to um, reformist candidates, centrist candidates, and convince the population that this is going to be a real election. And it's very difficult to see if he can do that. And at the same time, if he doesn't, and he gets a very low participation in the election, that's going to be a huge blow, huge blow to the regime itself. So where's I, the opposition now, then? Or what are they doing? Um, it depends. They've really split it in many different parts. Um, and there's some of them who are a little bit more inclined to see if they can still work within the system. Others who have completely lost their faith in the system's ability to reform itself into something more um, uh, acceptable. But I think, without sounding too... Um, uh, let me put it this way. There's a strategy in Iran that I don't think is particularly common over here. It's called patience. It means... <laughs> that when you don't have good options and you can't create those options, then you sit tight and you try to see if things can change and if an opportunity can emerge. In many ways, no one expected the green wave, including the green wave itself. Musavi was kind of taken aback by the huge support that he suddenly managed to get within a week or so. Um, so I think that is part of it. I don't think one should take a look at what, on the surface level, 
seems to be an absence of activities as the population having grown accustomed or accepted the regime. Rather, I think they're waiting for an opportunity. I think they're as far more unhappy than they were just a couple of years ago. But here's where I would perhaps, um, um, uh, perhaps caution a little bit when it comes to the strategy that we have here, which is to talk and at the same time tighten the sanctions. If the sanctions really were hitting the regime, perhaps the conversation would be different. But the sanctions are overwhelmingly hitting the regular population in Iran. With medical shortages and other things that start to look as the early years of the UN sanctions on Iraq. I think for not just because of the tremendous long-term value of having American soft power in Iran, because Iran is one of those countries in which the population generally tends to have very positive views of the United States, American cultural and American people. Not necessarily American foreign policy, but America as a whole. And that's definitely valuable to the United States in the long run. But if that's not convincing enough for Washington, one of the things they should not forget is this. The entire logic of the sanctions strategy is to create so much problems for the population so that the population blames the regime and puts pressure on the regime and by that changes the regime's calculation. If the population, however, blames the United States, then that pressure will not go towards the regime making a change, but it will go in other directions. And I think two things have happened. That is shifting the balance of anger more towards the United States. And that is, A, in the past, all of the economic woes and problems Iran, Iran had, it was difficult for the population to be able to determine, is this a result of the incompetence and the corruption of the regime, or is it as a result of sanctions? But with medical shortages, people know very clearly this is because of the sanctions. Even though medicine is exempted from the sanctions, because of the financial sanctions in which essentially all banks are refusing to deal with Iran, the Iranians still cannot buy this, even though it is exempted from the sanctions. Secondly, during the last round of talks, the US made it very clear that sanctions relief is not on the table. And that was largely because of domestic politics. The administration didn't feel like they could take the risk of lifting sanctions a couple of months before the elections. Those two things in combination, I think, is helping to shift the balance in a direction that is detrimental to the US. I think this strategy needs a lot of fine tuning beyond the moral problem that I have, that I have with this. It needs to have some fine tuning to make sure uh, it doesn't end up becoming just naked escalation that actually does the exact opposite of what we're trying to achieve. Okay, here, let's go to another question. Yeah, right at the back, go ahead. Okay, good, yeah, so how does oil figure into this if, if, if the price of oil increases significantly? How does that calculate and change and affect U.S. domestic policy and then foreign policy? Can I just start yeah, off sure. by saying something? Um, raise this a little bit? Absolutely, absolutely. thank you. Uh, I must have not given a good talk because we have more options than sanctions and war. I was trying to hit that point home. <laughs> Yeah. The first thing I would say is our options are not just that. We, diplomacy is a real option. As Ambassador also said, it's not been exhausted. Um, but I think we should be quite clear on the idea. If we get this type of a war, oil prices are going to skyrocket. When oil prices skyrocket, gas prices go up. When gas prices go up, job creation and everything else that is critical to make sure that this economy gets back on its feet is not going to happen. It's going to go in the opposite direction. And we just not had a very good conversation. I would say that the conversation, particularly in the media, tends to be quite hysterical, in which the frame oftentimes is, we either have to bomb Iran or accept an Iranian bomb. Those are not the options. Those are not the outcomes. There are plenty of other options on the table. We just need to get serious about them, and the Iranians need to get serious about them as well. But when we raise the debate to this hysterical level, we force ourselves to only look at bad options. And that's a mistake, that's a disfavor to ourselves. By the way, I just, you know, 
Our president has been clear that those who argue for war need to explain the consequences, and he is talking about economic consequences as well. Uh, and what the president is simply saying is there's more time for diplomacy, there's more time for, uh, for other measures, and that war should be a last resort. Absolutely. Uh, but at the end of the day, he's saying we can't live with a nuclear uh, a nuclear uh, Iran. Nuclear armed Iran. Nuclear armed Iran. Yeah. Ar yeah. And what, because the proliferation issues among the Sunni Arab states, I mean, if you think the Middle East is bad now, try a Middle East where there's a, a nuclear arms race, you know, in the Gulf states with Saudi Arabia and what that could mean in internal Saudi politics. Oil would shoot through the roof at that point, too. I, I agree with you 100 percent, Ambassador, and I think I think we should be very clear. I don't think this administration in any way, shape, or form is looking for a war. And certainly the U.S. military is not looking for a war. And you're also right that he said this on a couple of occasions. But I think the president is also having a couple of other factors that he has to take into consideration. If the president himself goes out and says this too often, it's going to send the wrong signal to some people he fears, I think, yeah. that he's not serious enough about this issue. It's going to make the Israelis become even more concerned. And as a result, he's, been, he's made those statements a few times. But it's others, not the president himself, that needs to carry that conversation with the public and explain what the consequences yeah. would be. OK. Um, let's go to, yeah, right here in the front. Go ahead. I'll repeat the question. I'll repeat it. Go ahead. So the question is, yeah, I, the question is one that you often hear in this debate. Why is Israel allowed to have nuclear weapons in the region but not Iran? Right, yeah. Right. Okay, so the question is, you know, why is Israel, why does the United States... So given the, yeah, given the fact that we already have a country that's a nuclear weapon state in the region, why shouldn't Iran allow to sort of act as a balance? Which, okay, we got the question. Great. Okay, Richard? Well, I, I want to just make an observation. I was reading Steven Pinker's book, and he has a haunting phrase there. He said that nuclear weapons should be given the Nobel Prize because they've kept peace in the world for the last 70 years. Tom? Well, a number of international relations theorists, most eminently Ken Waltz, as some of you know, is the, the, the leading, the, the inseminator of neorealist thinking, has argued, and there was an article in Foreign Affairs, some of you may have read, that actually having more nuclear weapons adds to the sense of security and stability. Uh, I guess I'm unpersuaded by that. My first professional experience was working the problems of nuclear weapons at the Defense, Defense Department. And every time I, I look at a picture of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which were destroyed by a 20 kiloton bomb, and I think of the possibility of, of mistake the possibility of panic, the difficulty of maintaining command and control, even in well-organized states, like the United States or the Soviet Union. You think of the times that we did come close to nuclear escalation in the, during the Cold War period. There were a number of occasions. Uh, it, makes, it makes you deeply concerned about this thesis that nuclear weapons will add to stability. And, and it has to assume that it will only add to stability if each country that acquires them, A, has an effective and cautious government, 
number one. And, and, number, and number two, that it will have sufficient technology and resources to make for itself a, an invulnerable second strike capability because if it has nuclear weapons and, only ha and they're exposed, it only has a first strike capability, then you obviously have a tremendously unstable situation. So I'm just, I'm just not persuaded by the argument that the continued proliferation of weapons, it's, it's true, and I'll stop with this, you could argue that if other Arab states had nuclear weapons, Israel might have been more restrained in responding to provocations than they wouldn't have been in, in 1982, Lebanese war, and a more recent Lebanese war to name too. It's possible to argue that. I just in the end find myself flinching from the idea of the further spread of weapons and that's why I would put, I would put a, the movement toward denuclearization, although it's whatever, that has to be defined and it's a very long-term process, at the very top of the U.S. foreign policy agenda, and it's nowhere near the top at the present time. Trita? I can say a couple of things. First of all, I think it's important to raise this issue because we're not going to have a lot of credibility if we're not willing to address that there is a nuclear weapon state in the Middle East that has 200 weapons, without a doubt. At the same time, though, I have to say in my own research, I did not see Israel's nuclear weapons having had any particular effect on the drive for the Iranians to go forward with their nuclear program. The Iranians restarted a program that was started under the time of the Shah, incidentally by the strong encouragement of two American fellows you may have heard of, Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld, were trying to convince the Shah and succeeded that Iran could not become a modern state without having nuclear programs. And by the way, you should buy the technology from the US. Now, so, uh, where was I going with that? Anyways, yeah. And then, then, <laughs> then uh, Khomeini froze the program, but then it was restarted. And it was restarted primarily because at the peace between Iraq and Iran, both sides knew that this peace was extremely fragile, and both sides were convinced that the other side would use nuclear weapons or some weapons of mass destruction at the earliest phase of any future war. And because the Iraqis did have a very advanced nuclear program, it seems to me that that was a much stronger factor as to why the Iranians restarted their program. And later on in the interviews with Saddam Hussein, we also found out that part of the reason why he was trying to come across as if he had more capabilities than he did was because he was afraid that the Iranians would realize that he's weaker than he was. I don't think he would have a more balanced situation in the Middle East if Iran also had a nuclear weapon. If balance is what we're looking for, I think he would have more of it if neither had nuclear weapons. And it's not an argument to say that it should be ignoring of uh, what is taking place in Israel. But we should also not forget, I was very pleased to see that there was a strong emphasis on international law, because we rarely have that conversation in Washington, D.C. But Iran is a signatory of the NPT. As a result, it has forsworn nuclear weapons. But it also has a right to enrichment. I think we would be much stronger on the side of international law by making sure the Iranians don't build a nuclear weapon, but accepting that they will have an enrichment program, granted that it is under the strictest forms, forms of uh, inspections. I think that puts us in a stronger position internationally because law is on our side, contrary to what it was during the Bush years when our objective was zero enrichment and we wanted, didn't want to see any activity in Iran. Chris, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, first of all, I don't, I, I don't think nuclear weapons have helped uh, Israel's deterrence. I think it's the, been the Israeli Defense Forces and the U.S. alliance. Uh, so I don't, I don't think nuclear weapons have helped them. As you know, they've never tested and never actually acknowledged their presence, but you're quite correct. Everyone uh, understands that they, that they have them, but I don't think it's really contributed to their, to their defense. Uh, I just want to make one comment, though, on this Bush administration issue. Uh, I had that same problem in, um, on the North Korean negotiations where the 
Bush administration, the people uh, trying to give instructions to the negotiators, saying uh, zero nuclear program. And uh, we worked very hard to uh, get people in Washington over the line to uh, acknowledge that an NPT state has the, uh, has the right to, um, to have a civil nuclear program. Uh, the problem the North Koreans created for themselves, though, is they, uh, they thought it was very clever to step out of the NPT. And so when they stepped out of the NPT, it gave uh, people in Washington the right to say, well, they're not an NPT state, uh, uh, therefore we're not going to give them any uh, right to nuclear uh, uh, power. So that took, a lot of, uh, that took a lot of effort, but we were successful. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we would be successful with, with Iran as well. And I think if there is an eventual diplomatic uh, solution here, it will involve Iran having a, uh, a civil nuclear program. Okay, let's go to another question here. Um, yeah, go ahead. I'll repeat the question. Go ahead. Speak it as loudly as you can, and I'll try and repeat it. The second question is actually about power. So, and um, the counter effects of sanctions on the U.S. dollar. Um, since the United States has been, you know, imposing all the sanctions, a lot of the countries have actually been engaging in barter trade with Iran. So, India, in Turkey, for example, has been buying oil uh, with gold or grain. You've been seeing uh, in bypassing the the dollar essentially, and you've also been seeing trade between China and Japan, um, you know, occurring with with the uh, with the yuan, basically bypassing um, the U.S. dollar. So, are we seeing the acceleration of um, the, or are we seeing a decline in power of of uh, U.S. economic dominance? Okay, Trudy, you want to handle the question about the alleged fatwa that. Um, um, Iran's supreme leader has issued prohibiting Iran on religious grounds from procuring and obtaining a nuclear weapon? I, I don't think it's alleged. I think he has issued a fatwa and earlier this year he repeated it several times and I think the Obama administration did something pretty clever. Uh, instead of completely dismissing it, obviously a fatwa is by no means a guarantee that would you know, make decision makers in the US uh, sleep tight at night. But instead of completely dismissing it, the, the argument was, well, that's great. That's, that's very good. We're very pleased to hear that. Now, what kind of objective mechanisms can you offer to make us feel confident that this fatwa will be followed? And I think that's a much more um, clever way of approaching this. So you had a period before the negotiations in which two things took place that I think paved the way for the negotiations, far more than the idea that the sanctions got the Iranians to the table. On the one hand, the Iranians went, made it very clear that they have the fatwa, they repeated at every opportunity that they're not going to build a weapon. On the other hand, President Obama went to the AIPAC conference and in spite of all of the pressure that he was under to say that his red line is a nuclear capable Iran, which essentially means no enrichment in Iran, he said that his uh, red line is a nuclear armed Iran. That doesn't mean that he is thrilled to see enrichment in Iran, but he kind of made it clear he's not going to go to war with Iran over enrichment alone. And that kind of paved the way because it created a little bit of a space in which both sides could agree in the sense that if the Iranians give the type of guarantees and the inspections and the verification and transparency that would enable the West to feel confident that they're not building a bomb and the West then accepts that Iran has enrichment, then you had the contours of a potential solution. Yeah, and then the second question was, is there any evidence to suggest um, that the sanctions on Iran are actually harming the U.S. economy and weakening the U.S. dollar because um, it's forcing Iran to engage in a barter trade with India and China that's not relying on the U.S. dollar for exchange and thus there are actually some unintended negative consequences for the U.S. economy. I haven't heard that before, but... Well, the, the Iranians yeah. uh, abandoned the dollar quite a, some time ago, right. I think, so I don't know if the latest sanctions had that much of an effect on it. Uh, they were trading much more in euros, et cetera, for the last couple of years. I, I, I simply don't know. I haven't seen any data that would support it in any direction. Yeah, either have I. I mean, uh, sanctions have a pretty bad track record uh, around the world. You can find a few successes. South Africa, although I would argue what happened in South Africa was more indigenous uh, uh, issues. 
the Balkans, sanctions against Serbia had the, had the effect of, um, of sort of fusing uh, mafia elements to uh, political elements. It's kind of disastrous. Uh, the issue about Iran, though, I mean, with, with uh, a few number of exports playing such a huge role in the, in the Iranian economy, oil being huge, uh, if the, the theory is if you could work with a lot of countries not to take Iranian oil, you could probably hurt the economy. Now, I, I agree with your, your point that this often goes right at the civilian sector. Uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, governmental sector isn't, isn't as hard hit. But then you've got to look at, at our politics. If you're going to say, hey, you've got to rule out military, and by the way, you've got to rule out sanctions, uh, and all that kind of clandestine stuff, that's kind of dirty pool as well. Uh, it, you know, you're leaving an, an American administration without a lot uh, to, you know, to, to, to work with there. And, you know, as I, I think you made the point, I made the point, the Iranians kind of have to meet us halfway, and they're not doing that. I mean, they're not having, you know, they, even these back channel things in Geneva, the Iranians have not come to us and say, you know, I think we can get there, it's going to take us a while. So we've got a problem with them. We, we do have a problem, and I, I do agree with you that um, the toolbox needs to be big and include a lot of different tools. My primary objection uh, to our current policy is that it's not that sanctions are included. I don't have any categorical opposition to sanctions, although I don't see a lot of track record of success for it, without a doubt. It's the intensity. We have a policy that is sanction-centric. Diplomacy is out there in the periphery. With the same toolbox, we could have had a policy that is much more diplomacy-centric, and sanctions are one of many other pools of pressure that can be used on occasion to make the point. But when you put sanctions at the center, we've got a situation in which actually both sides have a dual-track policy. Both sides have a policy in which, on the one hand, they agree to talk, and while they're talking, they're increasing pressure on the other side, thinking that actually strengthens their negotiating position. Well, what has happened so far is that every time either side has increased the pressure, and the way the U.S. increases the pressure is by adopting new sanctions, the way the Iranians increase the pressure is by advancing their nuclear program. Every time we add more sanctions, we've seen a track record in which the Iranians are actually expanding their program and going forward even more aggressively. Every time they do so, we feel like, well, hey, we have to do more sanctions. And it becomes a perpetual cycle in which there's fewer and fewer exit ramps. It's a sandbox fight, but you're kind of running out of sand. At some point, you have to throw stones. That's where the trajectory of this is going, which is concerning me a lot, because not only are the Iranians running out of escalatory options, their escalatory options are fewer and fewer and more and more dangerous, including one that they've been hinting at, for the last two weeks or so, which is they may walk out of the NPT. I don't think they will, but if they do, I think it would be crossing an American red line, uh, which actually could yield a military action. The de-escalatory options are also getting fewer and fewer. And to me, this is actually the greatest risk of war. I don't see the risk of war being particularly high in the sense that the US or the Iranians would actually push the button. I see that as pretty low. I see there's another risk in which it would be a naval accident or incident in the Persian Gulf and would escalate out of control. But more than anything else, I'm worried about the fact that with this dual track, both sides are just constantly adding more and more pressure. It's eliminating other options, making it more politically difficult to really invest in diplomacy. And at some point, we'll actually come back to ourselves and say, we don't have any other option left on the table but the military one. That's my big concern with this sanction-centric approach. Um, I'm hearing some thunder and lightning, which means we're going to have to start to wrap up. We have about 10 minutes left. Um, and so let me uh, try and get as many questions in here as possible. Let's go um, one, two, and then three on the end. Yeah, go ahead. If you can keep them as brief and as concise as possible, we'll, we'll get to as many people as possible in the last 10 minutes.
resolution. I like your toolbox that I was seeing in your poker game with each party having cards in and if you use tools in a toolbox, every party here refers to as a tool. Sir, I'm sorry to cut you off, but you know, we do have two more questions. It sounds more like a comment, unless you want to get to a question very quickly. Okay, let's go to the other two questions and then we'll try and get them to the panelists to answer all. Um, all. Who, who, who had their hand up second? Was it you? Yeah, go ahead. So the question is, is the, is the cyber attacks a, going to complicate the diplomatic process when, when the two sides do get together? So the question, okay, and the last, last question, yeah, right there at the end. Um, I just wanted to bring up the issue that I think um, Lam brought up um, on demographics and the possibility of there being something along the lines of an Arab Spring type activity within Iran, and if you see anything like that potentially happening with kind of younger population who are more socially aware, media savvy, and so the possibility of a uh, democratic uprising restarting itself within Iran. Okay, I'll ask the panelists to take any aspect of those questions and also to take this opportunity to give final sort of closing remarks with respect to this question of um, U.S.-Iran relations and the possibility of war. Um, and so anyone can go forward. Uh, Richard, you want to go ahead? I'll answer Ed yeah. Benton's question. I think the tools that are on the table, and I think they were mostly mentioned here to, tonight, and I think there is an optimistic end here. Okay, great, thanks. Trita? Um, to your question, absolutely. I don't think this is the most complex problem humanity has encountered. I think there's a solution to it. It's a question of political will on all sides happening at the same time. I think the contours of the deal is actually quite clear. It's the question is how we actually get there. Not too different from the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, in the sense that I think most people have an idea of what the contours of a solution has to be, but unfortunately it's difficult to get there. As to the second question, which was... About the cyber, the cyber attacks, warfare. yeah, and the diplom dip um, diplomatic fallout. Again, I think all of these different things... I mean, with the cyber warfare, it's, there is one risky thing, though, is because there was a testimony uh, by the U.S. military and the Armed Services Committee about six months before Sanger's book came out and kind of revealed what the administration had been involved in, in which the, the Pentagon's view was that if an attack of that nature had taken place on the U.S. as such a cyber attack, we would consider that an act of war. So that's the risk with some of these things. And go, again, I go back to what I said earlier on. I don't think one can categorically completely uh, exclude all different types of options, but when they become the center of the policy, I think the likelihood of success is going to be less, and I think the likelihood of co escalation and confrontation is going to be higher. As to the Arab Spring, um, I personally remain very confident and optimistic that Iran will continue to, um, the pro-democracy movement in Iran is not going to give up. The pro-democracy movement in Iran is, was not born in 2009, it was born more than 100 years ago in 1906 in the Constitutional Revolution. It's been a very long and burdensome uh, road to travel, oftentimes several steps back instead of going forward. But I think it's going to continue. And if I would say there's one significant difference between 
Egypt and Iran. And this is a simplistic analysis in some ways because there's plenty of differences. When you listen to the slogans at Tahrir Square, it sounded almost exactly as it did in Iran in 1979. The slogan was Mubarak must go. And the Iranians in 1979 said the Shah must go. What was clear from that was that everyone agreed that someone needs to go. But there was not at all an agreement on who has to come. And the Iranians have been taught a lesson that when you do a revolution, you know who you're revolting against, but you may be completely clueless about who you are revolting for. And in many ways, they've ended up in a much worse situation than they were in before. That has caused them to be much more cautious, caused them to realize that they have to be much more calculating. In the 09 elections, part of the reason why you saw so many people go out is because not only could they agree on which president needed to leave, but they had someone that they could rally around as well. Their strategy has to be more complex because they have to think more than one step ahead. The Egyptians didn't have the history of the Iranians in 1979, so it was much easier for them to go out there and just say, Mubarak needs to go. Hopefully, they will fare much, much better than the Iranians did. But again, just because you don't see the same type of activity in Iran, do not misjudge that as some sort of an impression that the Iranians are not that discontent. They just have a more complex situation to deal with. Tom? The, the complexity of the diplomacy in which we're engaged, and I focused on the question of the use of force, and the ambassador, Ambassador Hill, seemed to feel, and I agree with him, that the holding out the possibility of ultimately using force if, in fact, the Iranians are determined to, or appear determined to move to nuclear to nuclearization or weapons nuclearization uh, is part of the toolbox of an intensive diplomacy. But it also adds to the paranoia of the other, the other party. It's a little like the Daho doctrine of massive retaliation in case of a nuclear strike. If you remember the, the American Catholic archbishops were, were asked whether or not it would be moral to threaten a second strike, which means an anni annihilation of, of another nation if it struck you first. And they, their answer was, it is not immoral under present circumstances to threaten it, but it would be immoral to actually do it. And there's, you see the analogy here. I concluded that if we reach the end of the road, the worst case scenario, that force is the only thing left, it's not in our interest to do it, although I probably agree with Chris Hill that we probably would do it anyway. Uh, but if we took force off the table or were less clear about our willingness to use force as a last resort, we would be giving up one of our tools. So it's a two-edged tool, it seems to me. Thanks. Chris. Well, with regard to the issue of is it possible, and then the second question about cyber uh, uh, warfare, um, I think it is possible. I think there needs to be uh, a much more robust uh, diplomatic effort. Uh, I don't even know the name of our negotiator, which I find kind of weird. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I mean they, they meet for a day. I mean, I, you know, you can barely have coffee and those things in a day, and I, I just don't think it's been a very serious effort, frankly speaking. I think the, uh, the diplomatic toolbox uh, has to be greatly expanded. But I will say, when you're negotiating in these circumstances, you want, as, you, you want some tough things you know, on your side. You want to be able to say to, to uh, you know, the Iranians might say, well, you need to stop the cyber attacks. And you need to be able to say, look, no one's going to stop cyber attacks while you're producing nuclear weapons. Now, that's just the way it's going to be. Now, can we get on to the issue of uh, will you uh, end this, these nuclear weapons programs? How can, will we, can we agree that that's the goal? And then can we agree on some steps to get there? But uh, we're not going to be... Uh, giving in on sanctions, we're not going to be giving in on cyber, they'll say, oh, but you're inflaming our people. My answer to that, I've heard that even from the North Koreans, my answer to that is tough. 
You know, uh, uh, you know, they complain to us when, when we shut down a bank. And I said, you know, this is your life as a nuclear weapons wannabe. If you open a bank account on the moon, we'll figure out a way to go back to the moon. We'll shut that down, too. We're simply, we're going to look for every and all way to come after you. So that's just the reality, the life you've chosen. And now we have to see if you're prepared to choose another life. I'd be fairly tough with them. I mean, obviously, in negotiation, you've got to develop a bit of a relationship. Uh, it's not a matter of you know, going there at 10 in the morning, giving a speech, uh, demanding a transaction that you're not going to get in a day. So I don't think the whole technology of these negotiations is really, uh, is really there yet. I think it has to be a much more serious, uh, serious process. But um, I think these things like the uh, cyber attacks, which I'm not crazy about because I think there's a blowback against us. I mean, how can we go around the world asking, you know, talking about cyber uh, defense when we're the only country engaged in cyber attacks? But uh, I think it's this type of toughness in the Obama administration that offers the Obama administration the chance to have a better diplomatic track. I think if the Obama administration said, well, we're going to ease up on cyber, we're going to ease up on sanctions, and we're going to expand our diplomatic uh, track, I don't think they'd win this November election, for starters. And, uh, and I don't think they'd gain a lot of room to, for maneuver with the Congress. So I think the reality is, uh, the reality, and that's all I know about, is uh, we're going to have uh, sanctions, we're going to have cyber attacks, things like that. I mean, we even looked to shut down their electricity system the other day. I mean, it's unbelievable. But I think the, the, the Iranians need to understand we're deadly serious. We won't live with a nuclear weapon. We'll do a lot of things. Uh, and, uh, and I hope if we can really work on that, develop some of these relationships, presumably Dennis Ross was trying to do that. I mean, I think we need a lot more of that effort, and then we'll see what, uh, what happens, but I think it's possible. Great. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of the uh, program. Let me first apologize that we actually had to have this event on Yom Kippur. I realized that people were excluded from participating, but unfortunately, this issue is not going away, and there will be many opportunities for us to debate it in the coming months. Uh, let me thank the students. Uh, Erica Fine from Corbell and her uh, Middle East discussion group played an important role. Um, Gurgana, whose last name I cannot pronounce, but she's involved with the DU presidential debate. She's actually the one who really conceived of this um, event. Um, thank you to you and your students. And then finally, thank you to the, to the panel. Trita for coming from Washington, D.C. at a busy time. And uh, Richard, Tom, Chris, for your comments. You've raised the level of uh, discussion here at the University of Denver. We appreciate you being here. Thanks.